My name is uh, Stephen Kutesa. Currently, I'm the country representative of uh, GRS uh, Uganda. And I've worked for GRS for the last eight years, uh, where GRS also has an urban refugee program that has been in existence for the last uh, 15 years now. And it is receiving urban asylum seekers in Kampala. These are people who have not yet been granted refugee status so as to uh, go to the settlement gazetted uh, uh, camps, uh, which are 11 in number for now. And uh, a number of activities have been done for them, including giving them emergency material relief, advocacy and protection. We have education in emergencies, and also we do skills training as a way of uh, boosting up their integration processes and also to make themselves uh, reliant to be fishermen rather than getting fish from, uh, from the office. And the uh, majority of the people that are coming are coming from Uganda's neighbors, including the Democratic Republic of Congo, which, are, which uh, more or less gets 90% of the clients that we are receiving here currently. And then we have South Sudan, Kenya, Burundi, Rwanda. Some people trickle down all the way from Ethiopia and, uh, and the Litri as well. And when they come over here, they are served and supported for at least three months as they wait their process to be done by the office of the prime minister in collaboration with the unhcr and uh, the question is why would they be coming all the way to kampala we are seeing a changing trend in uh, urbanization of refugees uh, even those that have been settling in camps they have ended up coming back to kampala And uh, cited some of the cases include uh, uh, professional refugees. Uh, they have a lot of hope to get employment in an urban setting rather than in a camp setting, which is more or less a village uh, kind of setup. And secondly, also the social service provisions that in the urban setting in Kampala, people have <coughs> uh, the accessibility to social services is rather very easy compared to that in the settlement camps and also security-wise, physical protection. Most of the gazetted uh, settlements, they are next to the border lines. And given the fact that uh, our borders are very porous, uh, they, f they have a feeling that uh, it would be easier for their persecutors even to trace them in such settlements. So they end up uh, continuing their way to come to the urban setting. Despite the fact they don't have any coping means and mechanisms. And it is from this kind of background that nobody else in Kampala is providing any service that GRS has come up with these activities to provide them with the, the, the material relief, the advocacy and protection, uh, the education itself, and also the skills uh, training. Uh, what do we do uh, in emergency material relief? <coughs> we give them food, we give them accommodation, we give them emergency transport, we give them also uh, non-food items, including clothes, including maternity kits, uh, including also um, uh, sanitary uh, towels for the case of uh, uh, young girls. And also we do a lot of advocacy, which takes most of our, uh, the, the biggest component, because refugees do have a lot of varying needs, and as GRS, given the uh, resource constraints, we cannot do all of them. So we do a lot of networking and referral with our partner agencies, uh, including the Office of the Prime Minister, as mentioned. We have UNHCR, we have InterAid, the Refugee Law Project, we have African Centre for Treatment and Rehabilitation of Torture Victims. And uh, we do an assessment of case by case as they come in and we ascertain what kind of needs that they need, especially sexual gender-based violence cases uh, who come, uh, majority coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, especially women who have been violated, uh, sexual abused, raped. Uh, we send them uh, for treatment and also for uh, psychosocial uh, support. Uh, in the same line, we do get feedback from the 
referral agencies, the partner agencies, to know what kind of support was given to a person who has been referred. And in so doing, we give a holistic approach uh, in the intervention uh, of, the, uh, of the needs, that the varying needs that refugees do have. We also could do a lot of parish outreaches where we have done a mapping uh, to find out where these refugees stay in Kampala, which particular zones uh, these people stay. And this has given us an opportunity to go down and reach the local council leaders, who are the leaders at the grassroots. They stay with the refugees on a day-to-day basis in terms of getting accommodation, in terms of security and physical protection. These are the first offices to access. So we have identified all these areas where Rwandans stay, where Congolese stay, where Eritreans stay, where Somalis stay. And this has given us that opportunity that we go down there, talk to them, explain to them the refugee plight, explain to them the, the existing laws pertaining to protection of refugees. And this has boosted up the <coughs> and facilitated uh, the protection strategies given to, to the asylum seekers and also to move away uh, any xenophobia tendencies and discrimination tendencies among the host community to the, uh, to the refugee population. Uh, we also uh, commemorate events uh, with refugees even in a refugee situation, these people, they do have a time to smile. So we share, like International Women's Day, refugee, International Refugee Day, we share with them, they come and uh, given them specific themes. We attend and we, we enjoy the days together. We invite also the host community and this has painted another picture onto the face of refugees where they were looked at as people coming to exploit the host communities, looked at as people who have committed atrocities and now they are having the other positive way of looking at them. Like uh, also they have a contribution to community development. Like this particular year, 2014, we moved out to do a cleaning exercise. It was an environmental uh, cleaning exercise which was uh, conducted by the refugees. And uh, we involved the, the general, Inspector General of Police. He joined us and also the mayor of the, of the city. He came and joined us and all together we went out to clean us, to send a message to these people that yes, we are in a refugee situation, but also we have some positive contributions that we can bring to community development. And I think this has brought up a very good uh, uh, name. People have come up to start looking at people in a different perspective. And that is part of the advocacy work that we are doing and also continuously talking to the government, contributing to topics through other stakeholders and uh, a number of uh, policies have been reviewed and changed and I think that is a powerful tool uh, to see and ensure that refugees stay protected and their rights are protected and respected in the country of asylum. Uh, we also do education in emergencies where we give language trainings. Uh, we have English language which we have been having since 2004 and uh, the objective and rationale has been to boost up the integration. Language is a powerful tool in an integration process. And uh, we started as very small right now as we talk. We, we are even limited by space. We are having over 200 students who have reported to have English, which runs for one year. Uh, we have developed a curriculum for them. And uh, we are realizing as we move on, we are seeing uh, the love for language increasing day by day. And this indicates that it's actually a need which GRS has even involved other stakeholders on board because what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean. So we have brought other stakeholders who have also started some small language classes. And even within the refugee communities, we have encouraged them to start their own uh, language classes where they teach English, even French also, uh, for the case of those who come from Francophone-speaking countries. Like I mentioned, that skills training is also part of the new components we have adopted because from the beginning when we have the emergency material relief where we give handouts it creates a level of dependent syndrome at some point and um, we realize that it's not the way to go despite the fact that it's very relevant and important to support these people as they come but also it is very crucial and very important to have them gain skills that would help them in, a long, in the long run because that would be a, um, a sustainable approach 
so we've taken on skills training in terms of short courses, provided refugees, where needs assessment was done and they identified those courses they feel that they are very viable and relevant in their context. They have come up with hairdressing, they have come up with uh, fashion designing, catering, arts and crafts. Uh, so through these courses, where they are taken through uh, in a given period, they acquire these skills and they're in position to acquire some jobs, others are employed, others even self-start these kind of uh, small jobs that would help them to, to survive in, a, in an urban setting. We have some success stories. Uh, the pilot program started in 2010. Uh, pretty much in the hairdressing course, most of them are employed and also uh, you realize that hairdressing, they have their primary customers are their fellow beneficiaries. So they have door-to-door -door services where they give discounts to their fellow people because they are speaking the same language. So marketing has been very easy for them and more, or most of them, they are working. So that has been uh, another element which we are realizing. We, want, we are going to expand, we are expanding by each year and we want to take it on even in other uh, kind of um, uh, courses that uh, they are calling them male-oriented courses. They want carpentry, they want uh, metal fabrication, they want bricklaying and, um, uh, and, uh, and, and construction, uh, which are owing to availability of space. We are looking forward to, to adopt and put them uh, on board. Uh, we take them through a business training um, uh, aspect. Given that we are taking them through this kind of skills training, at the end of the day, the objective is to initiate or get involved in uh, businesses so we give them a package of uh, basic business skills training where they are oriented in um, skills to do with uh, saving um, how do i ma managing mega resources and all uh, how to manage and to go about uh, the, the the small monies and incomes that they have uh, uh, obtained and it's been done by the uganda institute of banking and financial services and i think it's really yielding results we have some success stories of them where people have been in position to save and you know increase on their household incomes and you are seeing we are seeing a number of them at least by now managing to take their children to school managing their medical bills managing their little rent and to get accommodation which is uh, which gives us hope that we are actually doing uh, something and uh, we have also initiated uh, exhibi product exhibitions product exhibitions Looking at uh, the arts and crafts as one of the courses, people were making products uh, uh, in, the, in the arts and crafts and we realized that marketing was one of their uh, challenges. So we said, how do we raise their voices? How do we raise them onto the market platform? So we organize, we organize product exhibitions and the latest where they participated, it was uh, for three countries, Kenya, Tanzania and Uganda. And uh, they were well represented. It was very good. Uh, and they have learned new skills by looking at products from Kenya, from Tanzania, from Burundi. Uh, they realized this has also enabled them to borrow some techniques in there and they have incorporated into their trainings. And this is boosting also the market, access to market and also sales promotion for their products. And uh, we are basically looking at a very good work. Uh, what are some of the best practices uh, of the project? Best practices include uh, involvement in number of uh, activities we do involve beneficiaries uh, in terms of where we organize clients meetings so as for them to review our previous activities and also plan for the way forward and I think this helps us they feel that they are part and parcel of all the project cycle from planning right to evaluation and secondly we have um, uh, the periodic team meetings. This help the staff. It's a very tough job of listening to people and their stories and all that. At the end of the day, they are breaking. So these team meetings help us to rejuvenate our efforts, our energies, and also it's a sharing way of having team building and team spirit to ensure that we are moving forward in the, in the right uh, direction. And then so the non-discriminatory tendencies we have in terms of we, it's holistic, we take on uh, all people, including by gender, nationality, people with special needs, the children, uh, all our activities, they are all inclusive. So that is also another very good uh, uh, practice that we do. And also sustainability, as I mentioned, it's coming on board to ensure that these people are self, uh, self uh, reliant.
some of the challenges. Uh, yeah, we financial constraints. Normally, resources vis-a-vis -vis the numbers, uh, the flow of beneficiaries is one of the major challenges, and also the delays in uh, refugee status determination. That despite that people at times opted to go to the settlement camps, they cannot do so because they don't have the legal documents, and this takes them long, and therefore this forces them to continuously come to GRS regardless of the extended time they have been in Kampala. What gives us hope as in terms of GRS, what keeps us moving in the kind of work we do uh, amidst all the challenges is one, that we get hope looking at the courage, looking at the resilience of these people we serve. That despite all the challenges, the problems they go through, they still have hope. They see still there is light at the end of the tunnel. They keep moving and that also keeps us moving.